Okay, welcome to the 22nd class meeting of EC574, the gradual level probability and random processes. We have just finished our second quiz. Then again, homework 11 uh, will be assigned. Handouts are already posted for the chapter six of the pebbles. There are, is my messages, especially for graduate students. You have to fill up your toolbox with a lot of tools, but you also have to practice with your tools so that you can always ready uh, to use it. This is the course overview. We cover the undergraduate material and then move to the notion of sequence of random variables. That is a kind of stepping stone to the next step. The next topic, the random processes. Uh, in the last meeting, we started to study random processes, but uh, we need to review uh, the last part of chapter seven and the first part of chapter six. So uh, we started to uh, discuss uh, what is sampling? And the sampling means a lot of different things, in, even in electrical engineering, in signal gen systems and the following courses. Sampling means usually uh, uh, we, uh, to convert the continuous time signal to a vector signal or a discrete time signal. However, that is not uh, the only sampling. Uh, the second one is related to the statistics, where uh, you take samples from the uh, the mother group kind of thing. The, uh, so you, you cannot observe all of the uh, data, so you take some of the data. That is called sampling. However, in machine learning, uh, they usually call sampling as what? Uh, generation of a random something. So generation of a random variable, generation of a random vector, that is called sampling. So you should be careful whether a person is talking about which of the uh, sampling when you uh, discuss with him or her. Uh, in that chapter of that section of sampling and some limit theorems, the sampling was just to uh, take the measurement. So it, uh, it is similar to the statistician's definition of sampling. And given the observation, uh, what you want to do is statistical inference. And there are two types of statistical inference. One is detection and the other is estimation. Of course, for the estimation, uh, you can perform uh, interval estimation, but uh, our focus was only on point estimation. And uh, the entire theory of detection and estimation uh, is usually covered our graduate level course EC645, the statistical signal processing. I'm not sure I will offer it or not, but probably uh, you'd, you'd better to check whether it is offered uh, in the beginning of next semester. Currently, it's not yet uh, given to the, uh, the university. For the point estimation and even the detection and, and uh, uh, the uh, we have subclasses because we want to estimate something first that may not be random but unknown, or uh, we want to uh, make an inference on a parameter that is randomly modeled, which means that uh, we know some prior knowledge that is uh, that provides a statistical uh, some information. But uh, in this section, in this section, uh, we focus on estimation and non-random parameter, especially uh, non-random parameter estimation. So it's kind of related to the one, only a one quarter of the entire statistical signal processing. Where first we had some uh, domain or index set for our uh, unknown parameter. Given that we had a family of distributions parameterized by theta. So the source has a lot of, for example, random vector generators in this case, and it chooses one of them depending on which theta is the true value. And then it generates the output observation. Suppose it's a, a random vector. And then what you want to do is that we want to build some system that could be a random mapping or a deterministic mapping, but 
that generates an estimate of this parameter based on our observation. And uh, this is called a point estimator. If, uh, if this set is a continuous set. Of course, continuous set is a little bit different from uncountable set. An uncountable sand can be uncountable, but it, it could be not continuous. But anyway, uh, it could be a continuous interval. It could be a set of all real numbers, blah, blah, blah. Okay. And uh, for the artistic reason, some people just uh, put another box here and say that the, here is the kind of information sink. So you provide this uh, result of your statistical inference to some sink so that the uh, sink can do something like a financial decision or something. And here, uh, so this is the problem. And uh, in order to uh, measure the performance of this uh, point estimator, we defined so-called uh, uh, bias. So bias is called the uh, expected error. Okay. The, uh, the problem is that uh, this expected error itself is affected by choice of theta. See that here? What is random in this expectation? What is random? Random is x, right? However, there are many, many, many uncountably infinite different distributions. So if you write it, for example, using some multidimensional integration r to the n, then what do you have? you have the value minus uh, the, the estimate minus uh, the true value times the density of x, but that density is parameterized by theta. So what do you have? What is this? This is a function of theta, okay? This is a function of theta, not because we subtract theta, even without that part, still this expectation is parameterized by theta. So in general, uh, the bias is a function of theta. It can, uh, it can, uh, it is not very likely that this is zero for all theta. So uh, the unbiasedness condition is a very restrictive. Uh, so uh, we may define the unbiasedness of an estimator, but the existence of an unbiased estimator is not guaranteed given the problem, given, given the observation model. So this is the definition of unbiasedness. And often, uh, as you've seen in the quiz, uh, and probably homework, uh, we need something more, not just the uh, unbiasedness, but also uh, we want to uh, find the minimum variance unbiased estimator. So we add one more thing. First, unbiasedness. And we want to minimize the, uh, the squared error. So here uh, we take the norm square averaged over uh, all x. Be careful, still, this error, mean squared error, you, if you want to say, is again parameterized by theta. So if you want to find that minimum variance unbiased estimator, it not only gives you this function of theta equals zero for all theta in the set, but also for each theta in this set, your estimator minimizes the uh, squared error. By the way, uh, some people just say that uh, this is mean squared error, but uh, precisely speaking due to the unbiasedness, this is what? This is just the error. 
right? So this is often said error variance, not mean squared error. So the name minimum variance unbiased estimate, got it? Of course, without the first condition, this cannot be named as the uh, error variance. But anyway, in order to minimize the variance of error, uh, you usually use the trace of the covariance matrix so that you uh, quite often see the computation of the error covariance matrix when you talk about unbiased estimators. Then what is consistent estimator? Consistency is related with some limit operation. That's why this section appeared in our chapter seven on the sequences of random variables where we learned the uh, four modes of convergence of random variables. Consistency may have a lot of meaning, but the simplest is something like this. So uh, suppose we our estimator can be easily expanded uh, for the uh, sequential observation or uh, variable length observation. So let me use uh, a superscript rather than the subscript because subscript uh, is misleadingly uh, mean the uh, some nth entry. So here superscript n means that the uh, uh, you have nth estimator, and uh, this uh, vector x sub n means its length n vector. And this converges to true value in some sense, as n tends to infinity. And we want to what? This happens for all theta. This is a kind of consistency. So. If we have enough number of, if we have enough number of samples, usually IID, uh, we have uh, the convergence. Since this is a random quantity, although this is a very special random quantity, you may say, uh, we have four modes and we have different definitions of consistency. <laughs> so as usual, uh, strong consistency is related to the convergence in almost sure sense, and uh, weak consistency is related to the uh, in probability sense. And we can devise other things. Also, sometimes uh, we may combine this consistency with unbiasedness and say that we have asymptotic unbiasedness, which means that it's not unbiased, but if we have large number of samples, it's almost unbiased. Something like that. Anyway, among many examples, uh, we've reviewed uh, two uh, estimators. Actually, uh, they are not separate uh, estimators, but uh, the uh, part of a uh, uh, estimator vector. So here, uh, theta vector is related to, for example, the mean, true mean, and the uh, true variance of, for example, Gaussian I IID generator. So what you want to have is that uh, you have a point estimator that generates uh, theta hat. And the first component, first component of this point estimator is what the arithmetic mean of the samples. So that is sample mean estimator. And the second, uh, element of this uh, output vector is so-called uh, sample variance estimator. And that has very interesting form because uh, even though the number of samples is n, we have in the denominator n minus one. Uh, this is quite actually obvious because we have only, if we have only one sample that is n equals one, how can we estimate variance? So it's kind of obvious. And then here we have the uh, I sample and the output of the sample mean estimator. So we have mu hat squared. And we can, you can easily uh, show that the, if you take the expectation of this one, actually uh, you have uh, the same value as the true variance. So in that sense, it is unbiased. If you use one over N instead of one over N minus one, 
it is biased. Of course, it is asymptotically unbiased because uh, if n is large enough, you have n terms and you have uh, n minus one in the denominator that, that approaches one. Anyway, uh, so uh, these are what you learned last time. And finally, but not the uh, least important, uh, we learned uh, the method of moment estimators. And they are quite simple because whenever your uh, quantity to be estimated can be rewritten as the moments of your observation. What you do is that you rely on low of large numbers and just plug in uh, the uh, arithmetic average of that first order moment, second order moment, third order moment, something like that. If you have large enough, especially IID or uncorrelated some conditions, then these estimators are quite simple and works very well. However, there are two things you have to remember. Last time I only mentioned one. The first one is that usually they are biased estimators. So sometimes you, you just uh, run some simulations and adjust, adjust so that it appears to be unbiased. For example, suppose you had this uh, sample variance estimator uh, without this n minus one, but n. Then with small n, you can easily see that there is some bias, but it can be simply corrected by scaling. Second one is that, the, uh, what was that? The first one is the biasness. And uh, second one is that the, you should be careful when you divide by your uh, arithmetic average. Sometimes if that value is very small, you have very large error. So be careful. Got it? It's similar to your undergraduate circuit theory uh, experiment. For example, given an RLC circuit, just simply just R circuit, you apply voltage and measure current. And you know, there are three different approaches to check your, whether your, uh, the Ohm's law is correct or not. One is that you use the formula uh, uh, V equals I times R. In that case, everything's smooth. But suppose you just uh, want to use that, okay, uh, let me divide V by I and uh, use R equals V divided by I. In that case, your measurement error in, in current may increase the error a lot in uh, estimating the resistance. Or if you want to uh, compute the estimate the conductance, then your measurement error in voltage may a lot amplify your uh, noise error, something like that. So whenever you use method moment estimator, first thing is that it may have bias. Second thing is that be careful in dividing by something. Anyway, uh, and then we move to chapter six, that is uh, the random process temporal characteristic. So uh, let me just use uh, the slide again. So the most important uh, thing you have to learn in this gradual level, random processes course, is what? The major theoretic definition of randoms everything. So first you have the underlying probability space. You always start in the level. And you may, uh, you may say that, oh, wait a minute, professor, uh, it seems that it's not that important. I've survived so far without using measure direct definition. And most of the uh, homework and exam uh, and even some QE uh, uh, problems, I didn't need that. You are right in some sense. However, in order to expand your knowledge, for example, you want to understand what is random field, what is a random graph, what is random something, what random tense or something. Sometimes it confuses you a lot because if you just believe your undergraduate tool is okay, saying that, okay, random variable is a variable with uncertainty. Random vector is a vector with uncertainty. Random graph, graph with a... Whenever you have a new random something, you have to devise a new definition, however, the major theoretic definition about random something, it always have the same form. It starts with an underlying probability space. And you have an outcome S. And then 
you have a mapping group. And if you want to have, if you want to, for example, deal with a, a, a three-dimensional field, like electric field with uncertainty, what you need to do is that you need to have a set of three-dimensional fields and you have a mapping rule that maps this sample space into that set of three-dimensional field. Got it? So this mapping in this inside this mapping rule, here is uh, God or something, and uh, here is a, 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 a set. So whenever input S arrives, then this guy uh, tries to find some object that matches to this one and then gives it, it to you. In that sense, in that sense, when you talk about random process, which means we want to uh, talk about random signal, we have a lot of signals here. Sometimes continuous time signals, sometimes discrete time signals. This is called, especially this set, this set, is especially called an ensemble. And especially for uh, when we talk about random uh, processes, the each element is called sample path or sample functions. Okay. And these are also called ensemble members as we listed here, sample function, sample pass, ensemble member, or as we always have done, a realization of, in this case, the random process. So suppose uh, uh, we talk about a time parameter. So here, this is the uh, time axis, and you have some function of t for each outcome s. In that case, you want to label this one as something like this, according to our previous definition, major theoretic definition. We always have put this outcome s by enclosing it with parentheses and put it uh, to the right side of that object name. So. Uh, this is more friendly notation. And sometimes, depending on what kind of time parameter you have, for example, this T may be the set of all real numbers, or T may be a member of the set of integers, right? Depending on what is the universal set for T, sometimes you have finite interval, but what the commonality of these two is that they have uncountably many elements. For this one, you have finite or countable, right? Sorry, countable. So here, in this case, or that case, we call this process a continuous time random process. So here, if you have infinite, uncountably infinite set for the time parameter, the random process is called a continuous parameter random process. And especially the parameter means time, it is called a continuous time random process. On the contrary, if this index set is an, uh, a countably infinite, countably infinite, set, then you call this parameter, this random process as a discrete parameter random process. And if the parameter means time, you call it a discrete time random process. Got it? So according to this definition, a sequence of random variables is a discrete time random process where this uh, universal set for time parameter is what? Is a natural number or uh, the set of non-negative integers, something like that. 
But usually I uh, prefer to call that case a random sequence. And if I say random process, I assume that uh, the time parameter can be uh, any integer. But you have to be careful because sometimes uh, you have, you'd better handle a time-limited continuous time random process. In that case, uh, without loss of generality, we may assume uh, that our uh, time interval of interest is uh, the interval from zero to some capital T. In that case, you have this uh, sample paths uh, that is very restricted. So T on this interval only. And you may say that what's the use of that? But actually, it's very, very important, especially when you develop some theory. Okay. And also, you may have uh, some question like, OK, what's the meaning of uh, infinity in uh, time index? It's like, according to our major theoretic definition, see that? Here is God, and if we follow major theoretic definition, it seems that we can observe a only single path, right? Because it occupies the entire time axis. But that is not what it meant, because you have to interpret negative infinity and positive infinity, not as negative infinity and positive infinity, but sufficiently small number real number t, and sufficiently large number t, something like that. So it's like if you, are, uh, if you have a signal that has an uh, interval large enough, then what your practical, uh, then your practical uh, problem, then you may regard it uh, spanning as uh, spanning over the entire interval. In that case, for example, uh, today you observe stock market price of something, and tomorrow you observe some other stock market price, and you may extrapolate uh, the, uh, the time before uh, 9 a.m. and the time after 3.30 p.m. Then in that case, you every day you have a new sample pass, something like that. So don't be too uh, perplexed by the notion of uh, infinity and negative infinity in the uh, time uh, for the time parameter. By the way, uh, in order to make our uh, notation more friendly to our uh, deterministic case, some people, for example, prefer, and actually most of them prefer uh, to use this notation uh, for a continuous time random process, and that notation for a discrete time uh, random process. However, some very uh, strict person always use this notation. So X subscript T, which means that, that they are always ready to put what? Parenthesis S. But see that here, it's absurd, right? This kind of notations look absurd. That's why major theoretic uh, guys love this notation. So you also need to know this kind of notation. And in some textbooks, they, they just sticking to use that one. Now, here goes some example. And this is very interesting. So in order to familiarize your, you with this uh, major theoretic definition, here goes the probability space that is very special. So we have only two outcomes, heads or tails. And each one has probability one third and two thirds. Got it? So here, this S can be heads or tails, right? And then you have a random process that is what? That is a mapping rule from the sample space to an ensemble of random uh, ensemble of sample paths. So here, we have how many, how many functions, time functions in this case? Only two. So in this bag, right, 
in this ensemble, we have only two signals. One is what? One is parameterized by H, and the other is parameterized by T. And this X of T of H as a function of T is cosine to pi T. So, and the other sample path marked by capital T is also continuous time signal. Now it's a, a sine function with the same frequency. Got it? So this example can be visualized in that way. Now let me ask you a question. Suppose your realized random process is this function. Then what can you know? In that case, you can exactly know what happened here, right? In that case, you know uh, that is uh, the s equals t. However, in many random processes, this is not possible. Okay? By the way, uh, due to the uh, powerful uh, mathematical definition, this mesotheoretic approach can be generalized to anyone, any, anything. For example, vector valued random process you haven't learned and you will not be learned. Uh, of course, I, I will a little bit cover, but in most of the textbooks, they don't talk about that for the uh, introductory uh, gradual level probability random processes. They do not talk about uh, vector value random plus. However, it's not that difficult. You can just use the uh, major theoretic definition. In that case, you have an underlying probability space, you have an outcome S, and the vector value random process is a mapping rule from the sample space to a set of deterministic uh, vector valued signals, something like that. Got it? So uh, as I already told you, uh, the random processes can be classified uh, into uh, uh, several uh, subclasses. But among them, the most important one is, as I told you, discrete parameter random processes set, continuous parameter random processes set. And also, uh, you have something interesting uh, like this continuous random process and discrete random process. This is very confusing because we have defined continuous parameter or continuous time random process. The difference is like this. If you observe the sample path, some sample path, right? If this T is in R, you will call it a continuous time random process. However, not this horizontal axis, but the vertical axis may have some property. So your values, your values of the random process at each time may take a value from a countably infinite set or an uncountably infinite set or a finite set, depending on these values, you, you can also classify random processes. So your random process evaluated at time some t0 can only take a value from a finite set or a countable set, then that random process is, a dis is called a discrete random process. If you can take value from a, a uncountably, uncountably infinite set, then it's called a, a continuous random process. So uh, let's see uh, some example. Suppose these are sample passes and all of the sample passes look like that. Then how can you classify this random process? It's a continuous time, continuous random process. Got it? So it's not that confusing. Just remember two axes. What about this? Discrete time, continuous random process. The next one is what? 
be careful. It's, it's a continuous time process, even though uh, it's a discrete random process. The last one is what? It's a discrete time, discrete random process. Got it? Now, uh, as we had a similar situation, we also uh, need to little bit distinguish a discrete time signal with a digital signal. A discrete time signal could be a discrete signal or a, a continuous signal. Similarly, a discrete time random process could be can be a discrete discrete time signal or a continuous discrete uh, sorry discrete discrete time random process or a continuous discrete time random process. But what about a digital signal with uncertainty? The problem and the question I often uh, was asked especially those uh, students in circuits theory or circuits lab, uh, they say something like this. Suppose this is continuous time axis, but you have some signals look like that. Sometimes it wants to reach some, for example, five volt, but there, there is some uh, transition. What is this one? If we just observe the sample paths, it is what? It is a continuous, continuous time random process, right? Of course, their ideal signal is a discrete continuous time random process, or they mathematically handle this signal as a discrete, discrete time random process. So uh, the same signal, the same real world signal can be modeled in many different ways, even though uh, we learned here uh, a method to classify random processes. So be careful, got it? And as I told you, electrical signal cannot be modeled as a function if you go down uh, to the uh, quantum physics level. Anyway, right? So these are all mathematical models. So you choose your model as you wish. And if it is, if it explains and predicts very well, your model is good. It has some breakdown points, then you devise or use new model that better fits to your new situation. Got it? Now, uh, this is the last topic of section one. And here goes another uh, classification. There are two types of random processes that could be predicted from the past value, past realization, or uh, that cannot be. Of course, there are uh, many random processes in the middle, but uh, depending on this, uh, according to this definition, deterministic process, random process, okay, is different from a uh, degenerate, which means that degenerate random process. Degenerate random process, I mean, is that it's a deterministic signal, okay? As I told you in the probability theory, any deterministic variable number can be modeled as a random variable with direct delta PDF, right? Similarly, you can just call any deterministic signal as a random process. But in that case, your ensemble has only one signal. So it could be said it is a degenerate random process. That is different from this definition of deterministic random process. So suppose you observe some sample path, but you don't know which one is realized. Okay? But If you have observation, if you have realization of the random process as up to some T0, if you predict the future value of sample pass, your random process is deterministic. If it is not, then it is not, it is non-deterministic. So let's see an example. So let's go back to our simplest example of sine and cosine. So suppose, suppose you observe a random process in this case, 
And up to some point, you are realized what you observe look like that. In that case, if you know the model of random process, can you predict the value in the future? Yes, right? So from any past observation, any future value can be predicted with probability one, okay? In that case, it is what? It is a deterministic random process. If it is not, it's non-deterministic. Got it? And let me give you a non-deterministic random process. It's very simple. It's like this. Let's consider a, a discrete random process, x sub n, who can have value 1 or negative 1 with equal probability. And xn's are all iid. And you observe the sample pass up to time n zero as something like this. Now, can you predict the future value? Of course not, right? Even if you have all the observation, countable infinite observation of the past realization, you cannot even predict the next one. Got it? So it's non-deterministic random process. And here goes a question about whether the signal is deterministic or not. So suppose your signal has uncertainty in the magnitude or amplitude and possibly frequency and phase, but it's a cosine signal. Now, given some time t0 and all the past values, now, can you perfectly predict the future value? Can you? Yes, right? So this is a deterministic random process. However, that rarely happens in the real world because in every measurement, we have measurement noise, which means that we have some noise added to here and we cannot 100% sure about these values. But mathematically, this is a deterministic random process. Okay, uh, let's move to the next section. And this section is quite interesting. So first, let me ask you a question. According to our major theoretic model, how did we characterize our, for example, random vector? How? And you may say that, okay, here goes the random experiment generating a sample. And here is a mapping rule. And here is a, a set of all uh, sample vectors, you may say that, right? Sample vectors. Parameterized by S. And then whenever input S comes in, then this ran random vector selects the corresponding vector. So let me use underline here and generates as an out, right? So in order to fully characterize first, we need to characterize this. We need to specify this probability space consisting of the sample space, event space, and probability measure. And second, this rule. That's it, right? But this is too complicated. So if, if the entries of this random vector are real valued, then what do we do? We somehow group this box and view that as what? As a new random experiment that has n-dimensional 
rear as the sam uh, as the uh, sample space, and then Borel sigma field corresponding to this r to the n as the event space, and then we have induced probability measure. Then now we don't need any mapping rule because the mapping rule is kind of uh, included in this new induced probability measure. And here at this point, we found something very interesting by considering only these events, which means that given a point x that consists of x1, x2, x3, dot 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 up to xn, you define so-called the joint CDF of this random vector, defined as what? As the probability of event that capital X1 is less than the first entry, capital X2 is less than or equal to the second entry, something like that. And this function is equivalent to specifying this induced probability measure. That's why we love the notion of CDF. In this case, the joint CDF. And from joint CDF, we could what? We could derive joint PDF. And even though this joint PDF, notion of joint PDF is not that essential or fundamental in the major theoretic definition, it is really appealing. And whenever you want to have some feeling about random something, you always have to resort this one because that starts from what? Multidimensional scattering, uh, scatter plot. And n-dimensional histogram. And its limit, right? And that really appeals to you in understanding what's going on. Of course, we can equivalently uh, define, uh, uh, characterize using joint characteristic function, something like that. Got it? So this was the uh, story uh, about the full characterization, right? Now, let's go back to my first question. How can you fully characterize a random process? If you exactly follow this one, nothing that special. So let me try to change. So this part is the same. The difference is that you now have signals, right? The output will be some sample pass. So you still keep that part and change this to that mapping rule. So actually, the random process can be fully characterized by specifying the probability space and this quite complicated two-parameter mapping rule, right? So for each S, for each T, you assign, for example, a real number. Now, the difficulty arises when you want to move to the first full characterization to second full characterization. Because here, this method can only work with what? With n, a finite number. It could be very, very large, trillion, 10 to the 10 to the 10 to the 10 to the million to the 10 to the something. However, if you assume this parameter t, is from an uncountable set, how can you do that, right? For example, if you restrict t to, a, a, to the set of integer, right? And in practical sense, if you have a sampler to digitize an analog signal, even though you have many, many samples, anyway, you have finite sample, right? In that case, you may say that every discrete time random process can be handled as a random vector. Actually, that is a correct approach. Sometimes it's 
impractical, but it is correct approach as an engineer. However, what about continuous timeline of process? Can you do this? That was the question of, or that was the uh, question answered by the, the Colmo group, the uh, statistician. And his approach started from this random vector case. In the random vector case, we had what? Finite random variables, right? And they are joint characteristic functions. This is the exactly same approach. So let's see why I talk about this one. So think about a random process, especially a continuous random process. Now, suppose you fix t0 and t1 and t2 and take samples. and put them in a vector. What do you have? Even though we write that this way, measure theoretic guys may want, okay. I have this one, right? But what about this one? These are random variables, which means that you have a random vector. So even though you have just defined a random process, if you take a finite number of that values at different time indices, it could be same, but anyway, you always reduce the random process to a random vector, right? That was the approach of Kolmogorov. So the Kolmogorov have shown this one. This is Kolmogorov's extension or existence or consistency theorem, depending on how you view this theorem, but it's like this. Suppose, suppose you can find, so for every and an integer, and every t1, t2, n tuple, tn, in r to the n. So it's like this. We want to use, we want to use the definition of a random vector in order to talk about full characterization of a random process. So anyway, you take samples. However, you can take as many samples as possible. So Kolmogorov's idea is that, okay, for every n, yeah, this is not a random variable, for every n, you can consider an n-dimensional real space and a point. Then you have t1 through t sub n. At that, t sub 1 through t sub n, you take the value of your random process. Then you form a vector. And let's call it uh, let's define this as T yeah. Uh, it doesn't matter. Anyway. And this vector is what? Is a random vector. And you can characterize this one by using what? According to our previous theory, a CDF, a joint CDF. So you have capital F sub, xt1, xt2, dot, 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 xtn, or x1, x2, dot, 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 xn. Be careful. Each one is what? A random variable, right? See that? Even though you have a mapping rule that is a two-parameter mapping rule from the sample space to a real number, if you fix t, it's a random variable, right? So this is the most important observation. If you fix t, 
then your random process reduces to a random variable. Now you sample many, many points, many diff different or possibly same points, and then you construct random vector, and this random vector must have full characterization by its joint CDN. Here, one of the reasons why this theorem is called the consistency theorem is that suppose you choose different capital N, but keeping the same this time instance capital N and add one more, for example. Then that random vector may have CDF. And that CDF, if it is marginalized by removing the last one by putting it plus infinity, must be the same as that one. Otherwise, it doesn't make sense. So for every n and every antiple, your CDF first must be given to you for full characterization. And if you change n and antiples, they must be all consistent, which means that if you have a higher dimensional one, and if you marginalize, it must be the same as what you had, the, uh, the CDF you had already. In that sense, if you have consistent joint CDFs for any antiple of time, then what? Then here goes the existence. This is same as you have some mapping group. Okay? So it's amazing. Okay? If you have a major theoretic definition, alternatively, you have that situation. You have consistent joint CDFs. It's obvious, right? from the major theoretic definition. However, this theorem says that if you have that situation, also there exists some strange mapping group. We may not find it, but the existence is guaranteed. Okay. What does that mean? Actually, we don't need to stick to this major theoretic definition. As far as we are given consistent set of joint CDFs, about any sampled vector from the taken from the random process, we have full characterization. Got it? So this Kolmogorov theorem is a foundation in talking about single random process, multiple random processes, and their dependence. Because see that suppose you have two random processes, and you want to talk about independence, for example. What would be the definition of independence? And as I told you, it seems very complicated if we just stick to our undergraduate approach. However, if we use this major theoretic approach, it's very easy to talk about that. So let's do that. So, it, so it's like this. Suppose you choose n equals 1, and you have picked t1 equals 0. And you have what? You have this CDF, right? And for example, suppose you choose n equals 2, and choose the same, but uh, different t2. Now you have what? You have joint CDF. Now you marginalize this one by plugging in infinity. Then according to our previous study, it must become the CDF of x0, and this must be the same as that one. That is the consistency, okay? If they are different, something's wrong, okay? Anyway. So Kolmogorov's theorem is the foundation to understand almost everything related to the, uh, every def other definitions related to the random processes. 
By the way, this Kolmogorov's approach to, uh, uh, to talk about full characterization of a random process can be extended to a discrete time. Because still you have, you may start like for every capital N, for every entiple. But when you take entiple, it's Z to the N. That's the only difference, not R to the N. And then your random vectors must have complete characterization, which means that joint CDF. And these joint CDFs must be consistent. Then what? Then there exists, we, we never know, but strange function mapping rule parameterized by T and S that has, that generates the, that consistent uh, set of joint CDFs, vice versa, okay? So this uh, direct part is very uh, amazing. The converse is actually almost uh, obvious given the mapping rule, uh, capital X sub T of S. So uh, before we talk about independence, let's more be uh, elaborate because this uh, Kolmogorov's uh, extension theorem or existence theorem or consistence theorem requires us to define the terms we used to discuss. So first thing is this one. This is the first order CDF of a random process. See that? If you evaluate random process at time t1, in this case, uh, we restrict our discussion to a continuous time random process. This is what? This is a random variable. So we just use our ordinary notation. Capital F sub random variable of some parameter. What is that? CDF. So this is exactly the CDF of random variable capital X of T1. So X evaluated at T1. Okay. And what is that? It's according to our previous definition, probability of event that X of T1, the random variable X of T1 is less than or equal to X1. Nothing more, nothing less. Now the question, <clears throat> what if you change T1. In general, this CDF changes. So in your first step in your Kolmogorov's extension theorem, you choose capital N equals one, right? Now, how many joint, how many one-dimensional CDFs you need to specify for full characterization of a random process, especially a continuous time random process? Because you have to change T and T can be uncountably infinite Actually, you need what? Uncountably infinite number of CDF. First order CDF. Hmm, not a good news, right? Now, you change. Oh, by the way, some people love this notation, and I really hate. But one of the reasons why people love that is that uh, this has what? Subscript, subscript. Usually, the, the, this Westerners, really hate subscript, subscript, subscripted subscript. They hate that. So see that? You see, capital F has subscript X. That is the name of random process, right? And you have parentheses, and they put everything here. This variable X1 here, and but X is evaluated at T1. So some people separate them with semicolon because in our previous definition of the second order CDF, right, joint CDF, we use the separator comma to uh, differentiate, uh, to distinguish x1 and x2. They do not want to confuse us. So even though our Easterners rarely use semicolon, Westerners really love uh, this semicolon. Semicolon is more than a comma. Okay, so more separating. So this means that uh, it's different from X1. They may have different units. Of course, X1 may be centimeter and T1 must be second or something, right? But if I were the writer, I would put T1 first because it's like I can read it like CDF of X at T1 comma X1, right? So some people love uh, T1 first and then X1 with even just comma or semicolon. So there are many, many different messy definitions. But 
This is most appealing. But even I do not really use that. Got it? Now, let's move to the second step of the Kolmogorov's theorem, capital N equals 2. So you choose T1 and T2, and then you take two random variables, capital X of T1 and capital X of T2. Put them together, you have a two-dimensional random vector, or random vector of length 2. And then the joint CDF of that random vector is what? The second-order CDF second order CDF of the random process for time T1 comma T2. So you have two random variables separated by comma in the subscript and two free variables x1 and x2 as the argument. And its definition is simply the two-dimensional CDF. And of course, different notations like that and like that. Ah, very complicated. Now, let me ask you a question. So how many two second order C joint CDF do you have given a discrete time or continuous time random process? Infinite. <laughs> Again, infinite. It could be countably infinite or uncountably infinite. So this consistency means you have to check the consistency for from infinite number of joint CDFs to uh, find an uh, infinite number of uh, first order CDFs. So it seems that, hey, it's hopeless. You are right. Yeah, you are right. So if you are just given arbitrary uh, class of uh, the, the group of joint CDFs, it's almost impossible to check the consistency. But anyway, theoretically, you can continue this to any n. So now you choose some n, very large. And you take large number of random variables taken from the random process and put them together. And you have now nth order CDF over random process. And this one, when marginalized, must be consistent to the previous, previous, previous steps, right? N minus one, da, 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 down to second and first order CDF. Got it? And as we've done for the uh, PDF of a random vector, we can define the first order, second order, any nth order joint PDF over random process by differentiating the uh, nth order, first order, second order, nth order uh, joint CDF over random process. Discrete time case is also straightforward. Now, uh, this is quite interesting topic, even though uh, the main body will appear in, in the later sections. Now, the, here goes my question. What is the expected value of a random process? For example, as I've shown here, don't look at this one, it's confusing, right? What is that one? So let's go back to our previous Example, so you have cosine 2 pi of t, and you have sine 2 pi of t, right? We have uh, one third and two thirds probability, right? What is the expected value, expected function? What is the expected function of this random process? And it may be confusing, but uh, it's very simple because whenever you have some notation given a random process, just view it as a random variable by fixing this t. So I'm asking, not this one, but first I'm asking something like this. What is that? Expected value of some random variable means integration of a value times probability. So at time zero, you have a random variable, right? What is that? This is one, this is zero. So
value 1 times probability 1 third, value 0 times probability 2 thirds, so you have 1 third. Right? And similarly, this original question can be written as the value cosine 2 pi ft times probability 1 third sine 2 pi ft times 2 thirds. And actually, this is what? This is a, a function of t. Right? It's obvious, right? Expected function. And that name is called what? Ensemble average over random process. So it's, it's a kind of average among these members in an ensemble. Or it's just called average process or mean process, mean function, mean path. Simply mean of x of t. Got it? So whenever you have expected value of a random process, don't view the random process as a random process. Just the fix t and try to view it as a random variable or random vector. Then you can recycle, reuse your previous definitions. Okay, now let me ask you a question. Is a sample pass representative? This is very important because when we define an expected value, especially the mean of a random variable, we call it a representative value. Do you remember? But as I told you, no representative value is really representative because it removes, it ignores a lot of information, right? For example, given a PDF, the PDF contains all the information, but you choose a single point and say that median. What? <laughs> you lose almost every information except a single value. Mean, median, max, mean, mode, everything. Similar thing happens when you talk about the, sample, uh, the mean pass of random process. And this is very, very important because it, it, it is historically very important. For example, when, when the United States Air Force tries to design their cockpit of a uh, fighter flight, they measure the height and uh, the uh, weight and every, everything of their pilots. And then they take the average and say that, okay, from this mean value, we have deviation. Okay, so if we allow this margin, everyone will feel good. And what happens? Everyone hated that, okay? So eventually they changed their idea. So they changed the design so that they, the, the seat can be adjusted, the angle, height of the seat, something like that, okay? Why? There, there goes the idea, for example, let's remember, let's remember this discrete time random process that is one or negative one, okay? What about each sample pass? Each sample pass has what? Either one or zeros. Uh, one or negative ones, right? Right? However, if one and negative one are equally likely, what is the mean pass? Zero for all n. Okay? First, is this sample pass a member of the ensemble? No! <laughs> right? So, the, the mean pass, even in this case, mean pass is not in the ensemble. It's not a sample pass, sample pass at all. Mean pass is not a sample pass. Got it? And, okay, then. Dr. Joe, it is time to wrap up. What else can Dr. you say? Joe, it is you can just say that the sample pass can be drastically different from the 
uh, sorry, mean paths can be drastically different from older sample paths. And not just the shape as a mathematical property, its continuity may be totally different. Its differentiability could be totally different from uh, the sample paths. For example, the sample paths are consisting of very smooth functions, but its mean path may be discontinuous. Got it? So you must be careful. This is actually happened same in the random vector. So suppose just consider two-dimensional random vector. Suppose this is the scatter plot. Only four points happens. Suppose equally likely. Then, see that? What is the mean? Mean is here. And the value never appears. Okay? If you increase the dimension, this really makes a lot of trouble. So never stick to the mean when you have high dimension. It could be very, very misleading. Okay, it could be very, very misleading. Anyway, so we've just seen uh, some examples, but let, let's go back to these full set of examples and uh, talk about stationarity next time. Okay, that's all for the day.